Topic Notes 6.2 Seagrasses and Mangroves This is a picture looking up into the many drop and prop roots coming off of a red mangrove. And red mangroves are one of the coolest trees around, in my opinion. And along with seagrasses, they're really very, very important to tropical communities. So we're going to learn all about it today. So the main idea here is that seagrasses and mangroves provide sources of primary production and habitat that support diverse ecosystems and add economic value to the local human populations. So our learning goals today, we want to identify the characteristics of seagrasses and mangroves. We want to discuss their importance in terms of primary and secondary productivity within the ecosystem. We want to identify the major seagrasses and mangroves that are found here in Florida. We want to explain about the reproductive strategies of mangroves and the adaptations mangroves have for living in salt water. And of course, we want to also look at the what we call the anthropogenic threats, uh, the threats that are from humans uh, to seagrasses and mangrove communities and how it relates to not only the ecology of estuaries, but also to humans uh, and their benefits to humans. So we'll start with seagrasses. Now, most people, if they look at this image, they'd see kind of like the grass in their lawn, but maybe overgrown a bit. And that's a pretty good comparison uh, because that's exactly what it looks like. This is actually a picture from underwater and it's showing seagrasses. But in truth, seagrasses aren't true grass. They're actually a type of flowering plant. They actually even pollinate and disperse their seeds through currents. They also spread through the growth of what we call horizontal rhizomes, or these extensions that go out into the sediment and produce new shoots and leaves as they go. Now, seagrass, under good conditions, can really grow rapidly, up to about a half inch per day, and they can actually produce up to 10 tons of leaves per acre per year. That's a lot. Seagrasses are a really important part of coastal estuary systems and even coral reef systems. They provide homes for not only adults, but juvenile species. Because they provide a shallow water area with plenty of hiding places and generally reduce predation, juvenile species really thrive here. And what we've found is that as many as 40,000 fish and 50 million small invertebrates can actually inhabit a single acre of seagrass. This is all due, of course, because of the high productivity. And really what's going on, and as we talk about how much uh, these seagrasses produce every year, that production really turns into detritus or dead organic matter. And that's a really big component of the ecosystem here. And of course, the other component is, is these seagrasses help stabilize sediments. The picture on the bottom right shows actually a root mass from seagrasses and how much sediment and soil that it really holds together. And that really gives you a pretty good clue. Uh, seagrass communities will help uh, retain sediments, reduce turbidity overall. And of course, there's economic benefits as well. Just for the state of Florida, we estimate that $55.4 billion annually uh, is produced or at least supported by seagrass beds. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the different major seagrass species we have in Florida. There's actually about seven, but we're only going to concentrate on the big three. The first one we're going to go over is shoal grass. The scientific name is Halliduli ridei. And by looking at the picture with the hand in it, you can see the size of the leaves for shoal grass. They're very thin and very short. Shoal grass tends to be a pioneer species. It will grow in very, very shallow water that's exposed to air during low tide oftentimes. It can also grow up into freshwater outfalls uh, because it can handle being exposed to large amounts of fresh water for given periods of time. Manatee grass of the genus Serengodium are really easy to identify because their leaves are round like spaghetti. You can actually roll them in your fingers pretty easily. 
Now manatee grass can often be found in deeper water than, let's say, shoal grass. But of course, we're not talking, you know, 30 feet deep, you know, 10, 15 feet deep sometimes in very clear water. In the picture in the middle there, you can actually see some of the different flowering bodies coming out in that particular sample of Serangodium. Now one thing manatee grass can't really tolerate is really a lot of fresh water or being exposed to air. Hence why this is a species that's going to be in a slightly bit deeper, more stable water than Halidouli. The last of the three species we're going to look at is turtle grass with the scientific name Thalassia testudinum. Now Thalassia is really well known for having very uh, tough, broad, ribbon-like leaves, very distinctive between the other two types of grass that we've looked at. Like manatee grass, they tend to be uh, found slightly deeper. Uh, they cannot tolerate fresh water or uh, exposure to the air. In fact, you'll often find uh, Thalassia and Serangodium sort of mixed together within beds. So when we think of grasses, we think about grazing animals like deer and antelope and whatnot that go and continually munch on the grass. Well, the truth is in the ocean, um, very few species actually directly feed on seagrasses. This is simply because they can't really digest it very well. But there are a few direct predators. Obviously manatees, which I didn't show a picture of here, but also green sea turtles. The picture on the left is actually a turtle uh, that we see very commonly at Blue Heron Bridge here locally. Um, she is nicknamed Tiffany. And you will often see her munching on some of the sh uh, short little grass that grows in the shallow water around Blue Heron Bridge. Now, Tiffany is sort of a, a teenage green sea turtle. Uh, she's not real young, but she's not reproductive age either. She's sort of right there in the middle. And of course, some other predators include sea urchins and even a few species of parrotfish. Not all of them, but a few. So if there's not a huge abundance of direct grazers on seagrass, how is this productivity working to the advantage of the ecosystem? Well, the answer really comes in detritus. Most of the energy captured from the sun by seagrasses are released as dead organic matter as the various leaves of the seagrass uh, die off and fall to the bottom. Here we have a whole community of detritivores and decomposers that work on all this material. This includes both filter feeders and deposit feeders of various different types, including crabs and shrimps and even little conchs, everything that basically eats detritus, uh, sea cucumbers. The interesting thing is, is that most of the detritivores really aren't even feeding on the detritus. They're really feeding on the bacteria and the microorganisms that are actually working to break down that detritus. Now, in terms of productivity, there's lots of add-ons to the seagrass community. The first is what we call epiphytes and epifauna. Now, these are basically plants and animals that live on the surface of something else. In the case of seagrasses, this tends to be what we consider little micro or filamentous algaes and small invertebrates that are encrusting on the seagrass blade itself. And on these pictures, you can kind of see that. On the very left, you can see the little extensions coming off, little algae growing on and extending off the seagrass blade itself. Even some pink coralline algae can be seen in that middle picture. In areas where there's abundant nutrients in the water, you can actually have quite a lot of epiphytes growing and an assemblage of different epifauna growing on these seagrass blades as well. Scientists are still really looking at just how much productivity of a seagrass bed comes from these epiphytes. And yes, if too many epiphytes are on the leaf, eventually that leaf of seagrass blade uh, will eventually die because, of course, if it can't get sun, it can't photosynthesize. An additional source of productivity actually comes from algae, specifically with something we call macroalgae. Now this isn't the pond scum that grows in your pool if you don't put a lot of chlorine in it. This stuff looks like a plant, and yet it is not. It is actually not a vascular plant at all. It has no internal vessels to move nutrients and water around. 
On the left uh, picture, you can see something we call a calerpa, or feather algae. And on the right is halomedia, or oatmeal algae. Now, most macroalgae do have what we call a holdfast, which most people would kind of relate to a root system, but it's really not. All it really does is hold the macroalgae to whatever surface it's growing on. It is not involved in nutrient uptake or anything like that. And of course, some of this algae can actually have calcium carbonate embedded in it, like the halomedia there in the middle picture. Uh, you can see the white, that's where the chlorophyll went away, and that leaves that, that white uh, calcium carbonate behind. This will actually add to the sediments on, in the seagrass bed community and also around coral reefs too. Whereas calerpa on the left side there is just fleshy. It doesn't have any carbonate, calcium carbonate in it at all. And there's a variety of macroalgae that you can find in various different colors as well. Um, and you'll find them interspersed within the seagrass community. So if you look at the seagrass community overall in terms of productivity, you have the seagrasses itself. Uh, you have the epiphytes that work on the seagrasses or live on the seagrasses. You have macroalgae and you even have uh, what we call benthic microalgae that live within the sediments as well. All of these things are, are basically adding to the productivity of the entire system. Now, of course, there are quite a few threats to seagrasses uh, throughout their range globally. Uh, one of them is actually propeller and ground uh, grounding scars. And this happens when a, a boat goes too shallow. The propeller cuts through the seagrass in that shallow water or a ship uh, actually runs aground accidentally and crashes into the shallow water. Either way, what you end up doing is cutting the horizontal rhizomes, and that leads a gap. And now water currents can take the sand within that gap and start eroding that sand away, and thus the root structures underneath the seagrasses that remain start to become undercut, and the sediment gets removed from them and eventually they start to die off and that gap gets wider and wider. Uh, so it takes a really long time for the seagrasses to actually get back together and seal over those types of scars. And of course, an even bigger issue, which really is tied to coastal development, is decreased light attenuation, otherwise known as the lights not reaching the seagrasses. And remember, seagrasses, along with all their epiphytes and the macroalgae, they all need sunlight to photosynthesize. Well, in coastal areas, when humans uh, dump a lot of nutrient-rich water from coastal lands, that will cause something called eutrophication. And eutrophication basically means you, you kind of uh, provide nutrients for a lot of the phytoplankton to grow, and it gets really murky really quickly. And then the seagrasses really can't grow. If the seagrasses can't grow, they start to die off sediments start to get released, that sedimentation starts to increase and decrease the water quality and the, increase the turbidity even more. Basically what we're getting down to is a positive feedback loop and not in a good way. Uh, positive feedback loops in nature tend not to do very well in terms of biodiversity, uh, but what's happening again, the more seagrasses die off, the worse the situation gets. And of course, a lot of other species will, will disappear along with seagrasses as these conditions increase. Okay, it's now time to talk about mangroves. Mangroves are kind of interesting because the term mangrove really isn't a taxonomic term in, in the general sense uh, that we tend to say uh, that, you know, this tree is related to this tree. Really not the case here. Mangroves are basically a, a group of trees that although unrelated, tend to exist in saltwater environments or have some sort of adaptations to those saltwater environments, uh, specifically in estuaries and, and tropical coastlines around the world. In fact, they actually, in tropical regions, cover up to 75% of these coastlines, which is a pretty big chunk. And of course, one of the key factors here is they tend to exist in places with no significant wave action. It's usually pretty calm all the time. This is also why mangroves tend to be associated with coral reefs in tropical regions because coral reefs are natural wave breakers. So mangroves tend to do very well on the nearshore side of coral reefs. This is 
also why in the Florida Keys, most of the coastline are mangrove coastlines, uh, because we have the third largest barrier reef in the world, the Keys Reef Line, that actually protects the shore. And if you've ever been down to the Keys, you might know already that they're really not very well known for their beaches. And there's a good reason for that. The few beaches that are actually in the Keys uh, are actually opposite of breaks in the reef where more wave action comes through. Now, mangroves, although they live in salt water, they don't actually have to. They're actually called facultative halophytes. And this is because they will grow very well in freshwater environments. However, they tend to be outcompeted in freshwater environments. So other plants that are more adapted than them will overgrow them. But in saltwater environments or brackish water environments, mangroves don't have that much competition and they really do uh, dominate these systems. Now mangroves are very important to coastal systems. First of all, they protect and stabilize the shoreline. You can just look at, uh, this is a red mangrove here, with their prop roots coming out and you can get an idea that they trap sediments and really they also dissipate wave action as that the waves come in um, they embrace that energy and dissipate it over time so that the sand doesn't flow back out. They also actually create more land in a manner of speaking and the way they reproduce and the way they grow in new areas. They'll continue to trap sediment and make more land. Mangroves also provide a source of primary productivity. And just like seagrasses, uh, we found, their leaves are actually really the, the big factor here. As their leaves fall off and gather uh, on the substrate, they become part of the detritus. And that detritus food web is really important to estuary systems and coastal systems. Beyond that, Mangroves provide habitats for not only submerged marine species, but they also work for a lot of terrestrial species, uh, be it some of the marine birds, uh, reptiles, whatnot, uh, that actually live in and around the mangroves uh, and even behind the mangroves. And of course, just like the seagrass beds, they do provide that home for a lot of the juvenile marine species uh, that are found throughout the region. Uh, here we can find little blue crabs, spotted sea trout, red drum, all sorts of things, grunts, uh, snapper, you name it. And not only that, they provide a buffer between the water, the runoff that comes from the land and going into the marine environment. And they help to filter that and soak up some of the nutrients. And so that's a really big function as well. All total, it's really hard to put a price tag on any of these habitats. But because people tend to respond well to, to monetary investment here, we've given it a shot. And right now, some of the figures range that uh, mangrove forests, and this is mature mangrove forests, are worth about 200000 to 900000 per square kilometer. Uh, and that variability there is based on what region of the world you're in, things like that. And of course, if you break that down, that's basically about 0.4 square miles, uh, $200,000 to $900,000 per 0.4 square miles. This is why we've finally gotten, over the years, people to start protecting mangroves, because they're starting to realize that they are really a financial investment in the economy of the area. So here in Florida, we have three main mangrove species, sometimes four if you consider the buttonwood, but we're not going to include that today. The first and probably the most well-recognized is the red mangrove. Its scientific name is Rhizophora mango. And they're very clearly uh, distinctive because of their very large prop roots that kind of walk out into the water and their drop roots that sort of drop down from the branches. These trees were once called the walking trees because of the way they looked and how they really approach uh, growth because they do slowly over time walk out into the water and as they do so they sort of continue to trap sediments and build land behind them. They have uh, pretty large waxy leaves that terminate in a bit of a point so you can easily distinguish them from the other mangrove species. 
black mangroves have kind of elliptical green leaves that sort of look like money on the back. It's kind of that light greenish sort of color. They've got dark scaly bark, which is sort of why they get the term black mangrove. And around the trunk, you'll notice these little finger-like extensions coming out of the soil. These are called nematophores, also known as dead man's fingers, and they're very characteristic to black mangroves. Now remember, black mangroves and most uh, plants in this kind of anoxic soil have to get oxygen somehow, so these nematophores are part of that process. And black mangroves, in terms of the zonation, tend to be found behind red mangroves. Part of this is because red mangroves uh, can handle being very well flushed. They actually need to have that flushing uh, from the open water. Black mangroves have actually the ability to kind of withstand a higher level of salinity. And that tends to happen a little bit behind the red mangroves where water gets trapped and evaporation occurs, which takes, of course, the water away and leaves the salt, makes it very salty. Uh, and black mangroves can sort of tolerate that a little better. Now, white mangroves are generally found behind the black mangroves. They tend to be a little bit higher uh, on the ground in terms of uh, that zonation. They have kind of broad round leaves and they tend to have these little uh, nectary glands at the base of their leaves. These glands actually produce a little sugar and it's thought that that sugar will attract ants that will protect the trees from uh, other herbivores. So here's a look at the overall zonation kind of as a whole. You have the red mangroves again out into the water. You have the black mangroves behind the reds uh, in kind of more of the shallow areas that sort of get dry docked during low tide. And then of course you have the white mangroves behind that. And of course farther back you'll have some buttonwood. Now this zonation does not always play out exactly as this shows in this nice little orderly diagram. Lots of various conditions and water you know, paths and fluctuations and sediment types and all those sorts of things they make a big difference and, and will kind of morph the, this zonation a little bit here and there, but it gives you a place to start and understand at least where these trees generally fall in the scheme of things. Now, as we're talking about, you know, exposure to salt water, how do mangroves deal with salinity? Well, there's a couple of ways. First of all, they will often concentrate the salt in leaves, and those leaves are generally called sacrificial leaves. They'll turn, you know, orangey, you know, color, and then they'll fall off, taking the salt with them. Red mangroves, because they're exposed directly to the water, uh, and that seems to be a lot of flushing, they actually are what we call excluders. So they'll exclude salt at the root surface, which is metabolically expensive. It's very difficult to do, uh, but they do it uh, very well. Now, black mangroves, because they deal with sometimes even higher salinities because of evaporation and whatnot, they don't exclude it. They take the salt in, but then they actually excrete the salt on the leaves. And this uh, picture to the right is the backside of a black mangrove leaf, and you can see the salt crystals developing on it. Reproduction is another really cool adaptation of mangroves. They exhibit vivipary. What this basically means is while the seed is still on the tree, uh, the plant will, the embryo will actually break through the seed coat and start growing right there attached to the parent tree. Hence the name live young. Now for red mangroves, uh, you may have seen these cigar shaped uh, kind of objects either hanging from the red mangrove trees or floating around in the water. They're called propagules and they are the seeds of the red mangroves. The cool thing about the propagules is they will float around uh, until they stick into the sand somewhere and then they'll start to grow. And as the picture indicates, there can be a single mangrove that starts growing in an area, trapping sediments, more propagules will eventually stick in that sand created by the, the mangrove tree and they'll grow as well, adding to the island and eventually becoming an island or more land. Of course, a lot of the threats to mangroves uh, are very similar in, in a lot of ways to seagrasses. Coastal development is a big issue. Obviously, people want to live and build along the coastline, and they tend not to want mangroves there. Over the years here, just in the Lake Worth Lagoon, we've lost about 87% of the mangrove shorelines. 
Today, of course, it's illegal to remove, destroy, or damage mangroves in Florida. You actually have to go through a whole process if you're building something uh, to deal with that. And of course, as we've found out over the years, seawalls just do not make up for mangroves. Uh, mangroves can, again, like we said before, accept that wave energy, dissipate it, and retain the sediments. Seawalls will eventually get eroded from underneath. They'll start to fall in and cave in, and you have to continually repair them. Mangroves don't need that. They do it all by themselves. And of course, coastal pollution, agricultural runoff, illegal dumping, all of those things threaten mangrove communities as well. All right, I know it's another long one. Thanks for hanging in there. And here is your in-depth question. How can healthy seagrass beds and mangrove shorelines help the economy of coastal towns and cities? I'll let you write about it and explain. And until next time, keep thinking.